Hi, this is Walter Weesey with Parks Fly Shops Fly Tying Video for March 12th, 2011. Today I'm going to be doing a spruce moth and it's uh, the one I'm doing is a pretty quick tie. And so first what I'm going to do here is uh, go through and, and point out some of the problems we see with some of the, the traditional uh, spruce moths. If you've never fished in the Rockies or if you haven't fished recently, um, spruce moths are a... Uh, well, I mean, they're, they're a, a moth that lives in evergreen trees, not just spruces. And their numbers have really been at a high peak the last few seasons, especially in 2008, 2007, 2008, but still high the last two years as well. And if that's a cyclical thing or a, or a climate change thing, we don't know. I, I lean towards the climate change thing because the, uh, the other parasite that, that's really hurting us out here is the... Uh, the mountain pine beetle, and the theory on that one is that it, it no longer gets cold enough to uh, to kill them off in the winter. But anyway, spruce moths are a very very important terrestrial to have, especially near trees. But uh, sometimes you can you can even catch fish on them in pretty widely scattered evergreen trees. Like for example, one time I had a great trip uh, doing the Carter's Bridge to Ninth Street section of the Yellowstone, which is right through Livingston, and. Uh, there's a lot of ornament, ornamental evergreens in Livingston as well as uh, as some evergreens there right at the put-in, which is kind of in a little canyon. And uh, I, I tied on a spruce moth with a itty-bitty tiny beadhead nymph on a long dropper uh, for my clients because everybody else at the boat ramp, there were a whole bunch of people putting in, and everybody else was rigging up with either hoppers or, or big nymph rigs, and so I wanted to try something different, and we really smoked them on the spruce moth. But anyway, um, we see some kind of issues with some of the basic spruce moths. This pattern here is an elk hair spruce moth and as you can see it's basically like just an elk hair caddis uh, but with if anything a, an even fatter body. This is a 12 or 14 very robustly tied fly um, and the thing about terrestrials is they don't really float that well um, most of them anyway and spruce moths are no exception. So here is a uh, Slightly lower profile fly, but you can see it still has a pretty big hackle, big flashy wing. It's still kind of a, it belongs to the sort of big flashy school of dry fly design. Um, we sell a lot more of these than we do of the uh, the elk hair one now. Um, in fact, we, we've actually dropped the elk hair one. It's just that last season we found a few extra dozen that we uh, had in the, in the fly cases that we just stuck on the shelf just to get rid of them. Um, then our in-house one, which is by far the best selling one that we have and the, be the most effective one is a very different fly. Um, this is one of the in-house ones I should say. This is one that Doug ties and as you can see that's a very very different pattern. Um, it's a, uh, a low rider pattern if anything it actually sinks and it's got a, a palmer hackle that's been pretty well hacked to pieces and then a big wide flat wing. You can see that wing would be very prominent from underneath. This is a, uh, a pheasant hen feather and or a head and pheasant feather and this one is designed to be fished behind a higher floating dry without any floating on it. It'll float either in the film or it'll sink a little bit. And so that, that imitates, we think, a lot better what the, the, rat, the actual bugs are going to do, which is get drowned pretty quickly, especially in fast water. And then the one I'm going to be tying is a new one for us this season in terms of uh, production tie. And it kind of splits the difference. It's still a it's still a dry salmon fly because let's face it, a lot of people want to fish dries, including you know us. But this one is a uh, um, it's going to float much lower and and kind of be more delicate. So my my hook here is a short shank size 14 dry fly hook. Um, I normally use barbless, but I, I just ran out of them, so I'm, I'm just finishing up this pack of barbed hooks. I'm switching all my all my hooks that I can to barbless. It's just easier. Um, my thread here is 60 Montana Fly Company sand. Um, I'm also kind of switching away from uni thread uh, as I use up the spools and moving to Montana Fly Company. You may or may not be able to tell how how thin this is for 60, but it's very very thin thin and strong for 60. It's probably uh, about the same diameter as uni 80, but it's it's probably stronger than uni 60. It's really tough to break. And my dubbing on this fly is a uh, Sandy Print Spruce Moth DK dubbing. Uh, it's a dubbing blend made by Doug Korn, one of our tires, used to work here. And uh, it's kind of just a, a, faint, a tan, light tan with a little faint shimmer to it. Kind of a, probably an Antron 
something like that. If you're gonna if you're gonna be tying this, I'd probably use a hairsier blend, um, hairsier Antron blend, and I'd pull out a lot of the guard hair. Or you can just call us up and buy some DK dubbing. I want this body to be kind of fuzzy, uh, fairly fat. You saw on that first fly I, I showed that a lot of the spruce moth patterns are pretty fat. This one isn't that fat, but it's, it's uh, a little fatter than you'd probably tie a caddis or especially a mayfly. And then the wing on this fly is a stack of uh, Montana Fly Company and Widow's Web, and you can use uh, whatever you like, uh, any, any hydrophobic synthetic. And what I've done here is I've stacked half a strand of beige under a full strand of tan, and it's actually more like two-thirds of a strand of, of, uh, of the beige. Because uh, the stuff, what it is, is a uh, hot dyed poly yarn that, that gets kind of a crinkle to it when you dye it, well, when they dye it. And it, it comes in hanks, but it still is kind of on, uh, it still kind of comes out as, as uh, bunches or, or strands. And so you can, you, you tend to, when you work with it, you tend to get kind of an even size, like a pencil sized um, bundle of fibers. And uh, so it's, it's one full one of those on top of the tan and then underneath it's a half of the, uh, of the beige. I'm going to tie that in, and this is going to come out to be a pretty robust wing for this size of fly. Um, they do have, I mean, if you look at a moth, most of them have a pretty robust wing. The wing is the most notable thing about them, except for some of them where they have a pretty robust body. And I'm not going to trim that wing. I'd, I'd like to tie that in just as a bundle like that, and if there's any fibers that are sticking out really egregiously, then I'll trim those. My hackle here is light ginger, and you can find one with a, uh, a bit of barring to it, like a medium ginger, that's like a medium bar ginger, where it's medium ginger bars over, over light ginger, that'd be even better. It's uh, getting tough to find that feather in general, and it's, I think, a fairly popular one for the hairdressers right now, so it's getting really tough to find those feathers. You kind of have two choices about how you handle the uh, the the wing butts there. I've, I've been cutting in, into a head like that because it keeps my area where I'm wrapping the hackle flat, makes it a little easier to wrap the hackle. And um, a lot of caddis flies and moths do have a fairly prominent uh, prominent head. I'm gonna pause this while I answer the phone. I remember how to pause it. Okay, sorry about that. Anyway. Um, what I've done here is, is uh, I've left that head long and then I also put a little super glue on the thread wraps to uh, kind of secure that wing. Since the wing is not hair, it doesn't compress, and so it's almost always a good idea to use some kind of a super glue or, or at least head cement uh, on that to secure it. And then I'm going to make four to six turns of the hackle, usually five. And I'm going to make all of those turns behind the head. Or the uh, or the wing butts, and then I'll secure it. On caddis flies and uh, and so on, I usually make one turn ahead of it. But on this one, I just I pull it up ahead of the wing, but I secure it immediately. If any of you are familiar with uh, a pattern called a CV. Uh, caddis variant, Chuck, Chuck Stranahan pattern. I think this looks a lot like it. Uh, also, I've, I've seen a pattern called the St. Varian caddis. I think it looks a lot like that as well. And uh, I, while I haven't tied any caddis like this, uh, it would certainly work just fine, I think. So, kind of my last step after I, after I uh, tie everything off and, and whip finish and trim my thread, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to hack off about all that hackle underneath the fly. I want that, want that to be basically flat. Um, so that's going to sit lower than the uh, the elk hair, elk hair uh, spruce moth, but have a similar profile. And those ha that hackle is going to act as as outriggers, help it help it stay level in the water column. The wing is it. Uh, this material is hydrophobic, so it floats well, 
but then the body is just regular fur. So if you don't put any floating on the body, but put it on the wing and hackle, it'll float low in the film, but still be easy to see. So what it, this one kind of does is splits the difference between the uh, production, uh, I keep wanting to call them salmon flies, between the production spruce moths and dugs, which, like I said, is kind of a, almost like a cripple or a stillborn or a uh, kind of a spent spruce moth. So there you go. And uh, apologize for the, the video quality uh, this week and probably for a while because one of my lamps broke and so usually I have a, a lamp sitting directly over the camera aimed down at the fly to kind of keep the uh, both sides of the fly illuminated but uh, that lamp broke so just got one lamp today. As always thanks for watching and if you have any questions feel free to contact us.